Um, can everybody hear me? Okay, great. Good evening. On behalf of the ACWD Board of Directors, I would like to welcome the public's participation in this special board meeting this evening. My name is Robert Shaver. I serve as the district's general manager. Members of the public may participate in this special board meeting by either using the Zoom application or by telephone. And this evening, this workshop will focus primarily on the proposed budget and will feature a presentation by ACWD staff. There will be pauses uh, at logical intervals so that members of the public may ask questions or engage with the board. If you're participating by Zoom, generally we ask that all participants mute their microphones unless speaking. You may also be placed on mute by the district secretary and the district secretary will unmute participants at the appropriate times when the board is receiving public comments. In Zoom, you'll be able to follow along and view the presentation materials as they are presented to the board. And at any time you may uh, submit a question or raise your hand using the Zoom application and uh, we'll be sure to give you an opportunity at the appropriate time to address the board. If you're participating by telephone audio, you may download presentation slides from the district's website at www.acwd.org. And please put your phone on mute to assure the best sound quality for everyone. And uh, you will also be given an opportunity at the appropriate times to uh, make comments or address the board. The Zoom webinar is being recorded and will be made available to the public for future viewing. And there will also be a closed session this evening. So while the board convenes in closed session, members of the public may remain logged in, logged on or, or stay on the phone. And uh, you will be informed of any board reports, announcements or other actions once the closed session is concluded. So with that, uh, that concludes the housekeeping, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Shaver. Uh, we'll call the meeting to order at 4.02 PM. Uh, can the district secretary please take roll call? Yes. Direct is we? Uh, here. Gunther? Here. Huang? Here. Steffi? Present. And Akwari? Here. Uh, Director Sethi, would you like to lead us in the salute to the flag? Yes. <clears throat> Follow after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. <clears throat> and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on to public comments on matters on this notice of special meeting. Are there any members of the public who wish to make a comment at this point? Hearing none and seeing no hands raised in the Zoom app, we will conclude public comments and move on to item four, a financial workshop 4.1, review of draft fiscal year 2021, 2022 and fiscal year 2022, 2023 budget. And I will turn it over to our general manager, Mr. Shaver. Thank you, President Akbari. Uh, the district's two-year budget is the near-term financial plan for the district and is designed to balance the short and long-term financial goals, support improved customer service obligations, finance key infrastructure needs, advance water conservation, meet new legislative and regulatory mandates, accomplish fishery restoration projects, protect and optimize the use of water supplies and improve the district's preparation for emergencies. So essentially what we're doing this evening is continuing the topics that we covered during the May 19th special board meeting including uh, forecast revenue, operating expenses, staffing levels, labor related costs during the two year budget period. And uh, where we're kind of picking, it, picking up is on the capital expenditures and multi-year financial scenarios. So with that, I will turn it over to our manager of finance, Mr. Jonathan Wunderlich. Great, thank you, Mr. Shaver. Um, and as Mr. Shaver mentioned, this is a continuation of the discussion we had last week with the board. Uh, in last week's uh, workshop, we primarily focused on updates to the budget document, uh, the key overarching budget assumptions, 
uh, as well as the operating budget. So we reviewed uh, in full the section of the presentation on the operating budget, which is where we concluded last week. And so our intent this week is to simply pick up the presentation where we left off uh, with the CIP section. And then, um, and so in, in just a moment, uh, Ms. Ipagunta, our project engineering manager will present the CIP uh, section of the presentation. And then Mr. Alm, our supervising financial analyst will present the general, you know, kind of financial planning metrics, as well as some scenarios related to uh, potential water conservation, given the current dry conditions. And, uh, and then we will um, kind of wrap up the presentation after that. But of course, uh, if there is a desire by the board, uh, we're always able to go back and revisit any of the elements that were presented last week. And so with that, I will turn it over to Ms. Ipagunta to present the CIP update. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Reka Ipagunta. I'm the um, project engineering manager. Um, I would like to ask Ms. Marco if she could go one slide before the one that is shown here. Thank you. Yeah, for the purpose of continuity, um, I wanted to make sure we'll continue with the last slide that was um, uh, ended last time. As uh, Mr. Koran presented, the expected capital investment this year for the current fiscal year is 50% um, more compared to last year, which is an increase from $32 million to $47 million. And I would like to sincerely thank staff, staff engineers for their tremendous support during these um, pandemic times. I think this is a great accomplishment um, on the side of the staff. And also I wanted to, um, there was a question on uh, whether staff has um, confidence on the number, especially for the current fiscal year. Uh, I just wanted to give some context uh, from the question that came last time. Um, for the current fiscal year, with two more months remaining, yes, we have confidence that we will meet our targets for the um, current year to um, just to provide context to board's concern. Uh, we have already invested about $43 million by end of April. So taking it to $47 million, I believe we are on, on right track on this one. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, so the CIP update I'm about to present is an effort from many across the district. So many thanks to everyone for their contribution. But before, before we go into the presentation, I want to remind everyone that there is a CAP spreadsheet that provides a comprehensive list of projects and programs proposed in our CIP plan. It's provided as a handout. Um, please note that there are multiple factors that influence how many projects we could complete each year. Um, the list has everything that's um, included in our 25 year plan outline. So just to highlight a few factors um, that influence the expenditures. Um, one is there are a number of projects that the board has not taken action yet. So these investments are um, on those projects are tied to board authorization. And also there are projects that have been authorized by the board but we would still need permits from external agencies. So again, these investments are again tight, contingent upon those um, timely permit approvals. So with that context um, in mind, uh, um, with that context, I think here is a high level agenda for the CIP update today. The first few slides will go over the CIP process and housekeeping information. And in the later part of the presentation, I'll go over the highlights of the proposed CIP. So the CIP updates will be presented as progression um, with a general 25 year plan overview and a summary of 10 year changes and, uh, and wrap it up with key capital investments proposed for the next two years. Next slide, please. Okay, so as you all know, CAP is a financial representation of the district's priorities, both short-term and long-term. So the two-year budget cycle prioritizes the capital projects based on system needs and operational impacts um, and identifies funding that's necessary to implement these capital projects. And we have used our CIP database that's built in-house by staff to capture all the updates and um, the financial planning model is the tool we use to identify if there are any 
annual fiscal constraints on spending. Next slide, please. So the board has seen this um, several times. This is our comprehensive CIP plan, um, but for the benefit of the public, um, I'll quickly go over it. So our CIP incorporates projects and programs to meet district strategic goals and um, projects identified, programs identified as part of our integrated resources plan. Um, CAP also incorporates our engineering report findings that prioritizes the capital projects to improve supply reliability, seismic reliability, and infrastructure sustainability. So our operational capital expenditures, including projects that would be required to meet regulatory requirements and um, other life cycle maintenance of assets are also included as part of the CAP um, plan. So both capital expenditures and operating expenditures are input to the financial planning model, but um, this will give us the guidance in terms of how much we can invest on the capital side. Next slide, please. So this is a screenshot of our financial planning model um, of our finance trends. We'll be going over this um, in the later part of this presentation, uh, but I, I wanted to emphasize that all the projects um, prioritized for strategic spending to address our capital infrastructure needs. And our CIP proposal that we are bringing today, it has been validated using our financial planning model and it is within the financial policy guidelines. Next slide, please. So before diving into the budget details, um, let me provide some context. Um, so in this round of CIP update, we have added new projects and I'll be covering those details in the slides that follow. We also revised the estimates for the CIP projects in flight as well as those identified for future. And our capital investment is um, anticipated to be around 80% of our adopted budget. Um, I, I, I think this is encouraging. And um, division managers across the district reviewed and evaluated our CIP plan based on resource needs uh, for the proposed projects during this update. Next slide, please. So, all right, um, this table, so we'll be going into some numbers here. So if you have any questions, um, please feel free to stop me. Um, this table shows the combustion of two consecutive budget cycles. Uh, for all time ranges, our budget needs are growing primarily because of the growing investment needs specific to renewals and replacements. So for example, for two year plan, our investment needs have gone up by 9% and same holds true for the other time ranges as well. So I'll walk you through the details in the next few slides. So specifically I'll focus on the 25 year plan in the next couple of slides. So here are the highlights of the changes to some of our large programs. So the programs marked green are contributing to an increase. As you can see, main renewal program is the main contributor to the overall increase. 50% of our planned budget for the next 25 years will support our updated main renewal program. So we discussed the main renewal program in detail at the April 1st board workshop. Um, the amounts here represent the approach uh, discussed at that time. The programs marked in purple, the fish passage and advanced metering infrastructure. Um, these, these projects are showing a reduction. Um, this is because we have already spent some money in these programs in the last two years. For example, on fish passage program, we are two thirds complete and we are in the last construction season. So we have only one third of the project left. So that's why we are seeing a reduction in the budget because of the spent amount. And the customer jobs is also showing reduction. This is just a snapshot in time based on the current real estate market dynamics and infield projects. And this would be updated as we get closer to those years. Next slide, please. Are we, do you wish to have questions as we go through on this? Yes, please. We can go back to the last slide, please. Okay, we have meter replacement and we have AMI. I thought the, the meter replacement was wrapped into the AMI. 
Right, all the meter replacement projects are wrapped into AMI, but this meter replacement that's included, this is the service line um, replacements and meter replacements. These meter replacement projects are focusing on um, some large meters that are not part of the AMI project. So that would address those and also future maintenance, any repairs that are not captured under the warranty of the AMI project or developer projects where we would have to install new meters. Those are captured under this um, service line and main replacement program, but everything that's captured under, under AMI is not captured here. It's not a duplicate. I'm, I'm amazed at the amount that there's, do we have a breakout of what is the SL, the SL stands for? The service line um, replacement. Service line. Yeah, that's an emergency uh, replacement. Uh, we have a bucket associated for service line replacements um, because uh, most of the service lines are replaced as part of our main renewal program. However, the service lines would break um, at a faster pace compared to the actual mains. Um, so that's why we needed a, uh, a separate CIP line item to take care of any service breaks. Uh, and also sometimes when there is a service, uh, service line break, we also take care of multiple service laterals in the same location because of permitting issue. It, it's more efficient to um, take care of others that are failing in the same area uh, because we, we take care of, we have to go through the repaving and all other requirements from the city. So for efficiency, we capture some of those as part of the service line. But in terms of breakdown, I can take a look at the CAP spreadsheet and provide you the better breakdown. I'd be, I'd be interested in that and also a discussion on whether we should be using ultrasonic meters for the new meters we're putting in, even the larger ones. Um, the second question I have, this, pas this passage is why the dramatic reduction um, from 43 to 13? Is that because we've spent 33 million on it? Correct. That is correct. So we have completed two construction seasons already. So we have spent already close to $33 million on that. So the, the remaining is what is left in the, in the current construction season. Okay. And when we had the briefing on AMI, we were told $50 million. We're now up to 77 to 75 million. Um, where did that appear? Or how did right. that appear? Yeah, as I mentioned, this is for the entire 25 year plan. So this includes a uh, second um, project for replacing the AMI system. So based on the life cycle, life cycle analysis, the useful life on the AMI system that is currently in progress is 20 years. So in 20 years later on our CIP, we have a line item to capture the uh, replacement um, part of this. So it's the second round. So what, what you are looking at basically is two rounds of AMI replacement in the 25 year lifespan. Okay. Maybe at some point we'll be able to do a more sober review of the benefit, cost benefit analysis for AMI. So thank you. Yeah, that would be updated as we get closer to that. This is currently a placeholder at this point. And, and this is Ed, and if I could just quickly add, um, uh, Ms. Ipagunta had it, um, of course, right. And that is um, the line item that you saw on the prior slide related to service line and meter replacements. That's really combining a few different CIP line items. The service line replacement portion of that is 23 million. So it's the vast majority. So the meter replacements is a smaller part. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. This captures some of the new projects that we have added um, to the CIP in this round. Um, I believe board has not seen these projects before. So I wanted to just emphasize some of the projects that were added. And um, we also have another slide to talk, talk about this um, in a little bit more detail. Um, and in, on, uh, so, so some of these new projects are added and um, these are again, placeholders. Um, we have not received um, board approval on these um, at this point. And um, the implementation is dependent on several factors on these projects. Um, and also we have made revisions to the cur current project. So the revisions are basically to include some programmatic changes 
um, as well as change, changes to cost estimates to reflect current market changes on, on, and on some projects when we have recent bids, we were able to use that information to update our estimates. So some of the changes are based on the revisions to the estimates and some are the new projects. Next slide, please. So, okay, in the next few slides, I'll go over the 25-year plan. Um, uh, it's a comparison of 25-year comparison showing the adapted budgets and also the proposed budgets. So the near-term focus in the next two to four years, the average investment is um, $50 million, um, which is um, slightly higher than what we are, um, we have invested so far in the current fiscal year and we are tracking towards $50 million. And then the average investment in the out years is $47 million. This used to be, uh, if you are looking at the blue lines here, blue line indicates the um, budgets adopted last year. So our average was in the range of 20 to $25 million somewhere here. But with the revised budgets, our average is now pretty much consistent with our near-term average, uh, $50 million. Um, so our out-year average is for $47 million. Uh, and again, um, this is uh, because of the um, main renewal ramp-up. The program was discussed at the last board workshop, and these investments in the out-years have nearly doubled because of the increase in inv anticipated investments in the main renewal program. And then some of the exceptions that I've noted here for fiscal year 3031, we have a placeholder project for Mission San Jose treatment plant recommissioning. Um, so that is, um, um, that is showing the exceptional increase uh, for that specific year. And also 4142 fiscal year 4243, these two years um, are showing the next round of AMI replacements. Um, again, as I mentioned, um, assuming 20-year life cycle, we are proposing a placeholder um, in 20, in 42, 43 to replace the AMI system. That's again proposed as a two-year um, project um, in that time frame. And then the third exception is in the year 43, 44. Um, this is related to the indirect portable reuse. Um, the study that is currently in um, in progress, um, uh, supported by Water Resources Group. So the project was um, already on the 25-year CIP plan. The only difference is the project is now deferred into the future year, um, which is um, 43, 40, uh, 44, and it may be shifted even beyond um, based on what was included in our urban water management plan. Um, so it's um, it's not within that horizon, so it may be shifted to the next horizon. So that that those were the main exceptions that are noted on this. Otherwise, our investments are expect, expected to be consistent throughout. Next slide, please. So this is a chart showing the 25-year CIP. Again, we are looking at um, nearly $1.4 billion of investment in the next 25 years. Um, of the $1.4 billion, 93% of the CIP supports our district strategic goals. Um, one and two, water supply um, uh, cost effectiveness and value and water supply reliability. And, and the remaining goes towards the customer jobs and other projects identified in the CIP. So here is a list of um, all the new projects added to the CIP um, and our financial commitments at different time ranges of the CIP. All the projects, all the new projects that are identified on this list, with the exception of Mission San Jose Water Treatment Plant Equipment Replacements, um, um, they are all um, proposed in the near term, within two and 10 year term. Um, so most of these investments will are expected to happen in the short term. Um, some of these include um, our brackish groundwater reclamation project. Um, this includes replacement of our desal wells, groundwater wells, um, art wells. Um, the, that, the, that specific line item um, includes property acquisitions 
and replacing um, three um, existing wells with three new, um, which includes drilling of new wells and equipping those, um, including um, all the electrical replacements. So th that's a placeholder project that we have added in this town. And then we also have um, Valsito's channel pipeline installation project. Um, this um, was based on the discussion that happened last year at the board meeting when we were talking about the Valsito's maintenance project. Um, the board um, um, uh, expressed interest in having a permanent um, alternative to our Valsito's channel. So this project was um, proposed to install a pipeline. And the project, again, as you all know, this includes um, acquisition of property from SFPUC in the city. So the acquisition is going to take some time. So the project is um, proposed in the 10-year um, time frame, starting in the fifth year and then taking about five years to complete the project. And then there are a couple of line items for PFOS. Um, again, these are placeholders. We don't have um, uh, um, maximum contaminant level or MCL for PFOS. At this point in the near term, in the next two years, we'll focus on a steady project to identify the treatment um, technologies that are available in the industry and what's the appropriate technology for treating our groundwater based on the constituents that we have. Um, so that we are prepared. Um, if there is an MCL that's established in the next couple of years, we have direction to go forward. And also there are a couple of line items, uh, one for um, making um, necessary uh, distribution system improvements to separate the distribution system from um, our groundwater wells if PFAS concentrations go up beyond MCL. And also we have a line item for installing treatment um, uh, treatment improvements um, to treat PFOS. So again, these are placeholders at this time. Um, once the study is completed, once we have direction on the regulatory requirements, um, the, the remaining projects will be, um, will, will pursue. I think those are the key highlights here. Um, I, I have some questions on the last slide, please. So, um, on the seismic study update, is this uh, an update to the 2008 study that we conducted? That is correct. And uh, this is again, um, something that we have discussed at the green renewal program workshop. So the main intent of this study is to focus on the distribution system, seismic vulnerabilities um, that would also capture our transmission mains, distribution mains, um, a storage, we have a um, decent amount of information from our 2008 study. Um, how we would like to use this to do an update to our existing study. Is this the estimated cost to um, farm this work out to a consulting firm? Correct. And on the uh, uh, main renewal, the Lindsay tract, can you describe what that is all about? Um, what we're doing near term and long term yes of course so that's the that's part of our main renewal program initially we were looking at several small diameter pipelines in the tri-city area we have identified about five to six miles of pipeline um, and um, when we were reviewing those projects we had quarterly meetings with city of newark and we found out um, that they were um, they, they have a project on their capital plan to reconstruct the street on a um, couple of areas on Birch Street, and um, they call it Lin Lindsay Track. The streets are in, um, in, in, in not in a great shape, so they, they were already planning uh, major street re reconstruction on those streets. That adds up to about um, 7,000 um, uh, linear feet of pipeline for us, so we... Um, we initiated uh, discussions with them and got into cooperative agreement. Um, while they are doing the reconstruction of the streets, it would be uh, mutually beneficial and economically scalable for both agencies if we partner with them. Um, so we have incorporated our project um, uh, as a joint project with, um, with the city of Newark. So both design and construction of the projects are incorporated into that cooperative agreement. So we just initiated the design on that. So it's again a multi-year project. We just um, started the design effort with the surveying. Um, 
So the next couple of years, we'll be focusing on design and bidding and then getting into construction in the following year. I'd like to make a request that um, we have a presentation specifically on the Lindsay tract and what's going on in the engineering and IT committee sometime, sometime uh, later this year. Be very interesting just to geographically uh, survey uh, what we're doing. Thank yeah, we can. Sure. Yeah, we'll definitely agendize that. We'll, we'll we'll revisit it. We have talked about it um, in the past, and the board did approve the cooperative agreement previously. But it's definitely worth an update now um, because the work is really starting in earnest now. So we'll we'll definitely review the whole thing with the with the committee. Great. Uh, that's the extent of my questions. Thank you. Uh, John, we just a quick comment. I note the Valacitas Channel Pipeline project is here. My frustration is the extraordinary cost and extortion we went through on the clearing the channel. Hopefully the pipeline will go in before we have to revisit the, uh, the meetings with the environmental regulators. Oh, thank you. If there are no other questions on this slide, can we move on to the next slide, please? Okay, so here is um, another chart um, showing the breakdown of our CIP um, by reliability. So 63% of our proposed CIP will improve reliability. And we also have 30% um, of our CIP allocated for water supply and water quality enhancements. And the rest is going towards customer jobs and, um, and um, other um, projects. Uh, and, and as you know, the customer jobs have no impact on the rates. Next slide, please. So this is another um, graphic um, showing the breakdown of our 25 year CIP by funding source. Um, again, 70% of the CIP is, um, um, is part of our general fund. And then we have facility improvement fund and facilities renewal fund that contributes to about 22% of the CIP. Um, so nearly 31% of our CIP is funded by um, development related charges and 70% um, of the CIP influences rates. Next slide, please. So in the next few slides, um, I will shift from the 25 year plan to 10 year CIP. So this is again uh, a graphical representation of our 10 year CIP. So on this one, we are focusing on our large programs that we are already working on or will be focusing on in the next few years. As you can see the, um, the investment on, as the investments on our fish passage program are going down because of the, um, of the investments we have already made on that program as we get to the tail end of the program, our investments on the advanced metering infrastructure is um, going to increase. And in addition to that seismic improvements, that is going to be the main focus for the next 10 years. We do have several projects for um, reservoir roof replacements to enhance seismic, um, uh, se seismic improvements. Um, and also several projects and, and nearly 25% um, of our CIP uh, for the next 25, 25, 10 years will focus on our main renewal program. And we do have a large number of projects in the other bucket. On the next slide, I'll touch on what those projects that are categorized under um, other category. Next slide, please. So here is um, just a handful of projects um, just to show you um, what those projects include in the next um, 10 years that are, that are, that are part of the 40% budget in the 10 year CIP um, that adds up to about $200 million. Um, so one, we have Los Vicaros Reservoir Expansion Project. Um, this is currently included as an estimated cost um, of um, district's participation in this program. And this is still a very preliminary estimate and this has not been um, approved by the board. Um, the staff is uh, in the process of engaging with Contra Costa Water District um, to develop a more refined cost estimate and also business case to present this to the board. 
Um, this will go in conjunction with our joint powers authority. So the board, board has not made uh, a decision on participation, but we do have a placeholder on our CIP to capture um, the funding that would be necessary if we go in that direction. So the final decision to participation and um, participate on in this program would come with a commitment to participate in uh, bond financing and other um, considerations as well. And then we do have um, several other projects on our CIP. Um, some um, major upgrades to our treatment plan projects. This also includes our PFOS um, uh, treatment plant up, um, improvement projects. And then we have um, um, production well and pump replacement. Some of them are routine replacements for our pumps. And we do have several projects for replacing our aging groundwater wells. Um, and we have a program, um, as uh, the board is aware of our distribution PLC um, upgrade program. Um, this, um, this is an ongoing program. And we have a project for upgrading our SCADA. Um, so that, that is currently in progress. So some of these projects would add up to 23. Um, and we do have several projects for booster station upgrades. Currently, we are already working on a couple of booster stations. Uh, one at Canyon Heights and one at Kirtner. Um, there are a couple of other projects that are also part of the CIP. And then we have vehicles, equipment, tools, and replacements and other IT projects um, that are part of the other category. If I could quickly on the Los Vaqueros, uh, back to the last slide, uh, the reservoir expansion, there was an option for a pipeline only as opposed to buying the whole enchilada. Um, I did not see that in the cost analysis done by Bartel. I would ask that we uh, run the numbers for the pipeline only option. That's the Bethany transfer pipeline. Right, I think um, staff will be prepared to provide uh, not only that, but you know, complete business cases when we present to the board uh, for those various options. All right, thank you. My concern was it was, I did not see any breakout there on the uh, Bartel economic financial analysis. It was added as a part of our last packet. Mm -hmm. um, I can assure you, Director Weed, that staff um, knows that you're very interested in that, and we will provide the business case. And with that may come, and something that's not in here, the improvements to the uh, Bethany Reservoir, which the state of California is talking about doing for the DWR. And um, does that do we, would we end up participating in that? Would that be an analysis that would be independent since it's rolled into our state water fee? I'm not aware that there is a proposed project to do that by DWR. Uh, maybe Laura is. Um, Bob, uh, this is Paul Seven. Yeah. <clears throat> At our last uh, meeting of the Delta Conveyance Finance Authority, we were given a presentation by the new interim director of the design and construction authority. And they uh, made a presentation on this third alternative that they're looking at for the expansion and upgrade of Bethany Reservoir. And I asked a number of questions about that. So uh, uh, of DWR staff. So it definitely is something new um, uh, and is being talked about. Okay. I don't know all the details, but if you go to the Design and Construction Authority website, there's information about it on there. there all right. Are, Th thank there, you. Thank there, you, Director. Eastern, Eastern Solution or Eastern Tunnel Solution, the Central Tunnel, and then they're looking at this new Bethany Reservoir, uh, more Western solution. Okay. Um, when we when we do provide um, the the Los Vaqueros related business case analysis to the board, um, we'll do our best to make sure that it incorporates latest and greatest information um, regarding any any plans out there. It's going to be um, the whole thing is going to be a bit challenging. Um, I remember uh, when we were having a conversation uh, doing our strategic planning effort that some of these initiatives will ripen uh, to a point where um, we may you know, need to make certain decisions based on information 
when we would prefer to have even more information. Uh, but I think uh, regarding the business case analysis, we're, we're getting pretty close to be able to provide that to the full board. <clears throat> and Laura or John, if you have any additional information about that, you can, you can uh, chime in. Yeah, we've had um, some recent meetings with CCWD staff and, you know, I fully anticipate that we can provide a business case to the board in conjunction with bringing the JPA agreement forward. Uh, but I, I would just want to caution that it that will be a draft business case based on the best available information to us at that time. Uh, there will still be factors that need to be negotiated and finalized even after um, the JPA agreement is done. And there are still other off ramps after that available to the board. So it's by no means a final commitment. Um, Ms. Ms. Ipagunta, I would appreciate it if periodically you would ask, pause and ask if there are any questions so that we don't have to interrupt you. And I do have a question on this slide in reference to the vehicle capital of 10 million. Uh, at our recent, um, uh, just recently, the Air Resources, California Air Resources Control Board announced that they are um, uh, finalizing the rules for state and local government agencies to upgrade their um, their uh, their fleets to um, energy efficient vehicles, and. Uh, I'm wondering if we've taken this into account and there's a lot of concern on this issue by local government units because uh, for midsize and heavy duty equipment, there is, there's no equipment available to purchase in, in the open market. But the, the representatives of the Air, Con Air Resources Control Board are indicating that they are going to force the market to produce these products for purchase and they're looking very near term. They're, they're saying that they're contemplating uh, implementing these rules so that uh, we have to make this shift as soon as 2023, 2024 or 2027 moving forward. So I'm wondering whether the 10 million represents a standard replacement of our fleet or are we contemplating having to move to all these energy efficient uh, vehicles, especially with our heavy duty uh, vehicles, which they're contemplating, um, you know, just reading articles, people are contemplating that these are going to be much more expensive vehicles than uh, what is commercially available today. We are certainly looking at different options um, um, on the light duty vehicles, um, considering the new requirements and regulations. But what, what we have in the CIP um, represents um, a true replacement cost. Um, but recently there have been some discussions um, and we would be capturing um, those options after the financial analysis has been completed on that. And we have clear direction in terms of um, any changes to that program that would be captured in the next round. So what I'm showing here um, doesn't reflect the new discussions um, or, or um, changes um, to, to our light duty vehicles at this point. Right, and, and with reference to the light duty vehicles. These are basically about Ford F-250s and smaller. Um, the plan is uh, to transition uh, to a leasing model for those vehicles and uh, we'll be presenting to committee and uh, the board um, at the June board meeting. So, you know, it's kind of a you know weird time where we're also going through the budget process, but uh, we are aware of the Air Resource Board, you know, sort of pivot and what that may mean for us. And we're trying to pivot accordingly to um, and achieve a bunch of other goals related to how we manage our fleet. So uh, I think that's a good teaser for the June board meeting. You know, I would also suggest that it's an opportunity to work with other uh, public agencies, especially water and sanitary, 
where we could um, uh, exercise group purchases of th these types of equipment that are common to all. Right. Uh, we already do that with our standard vehicles, but I think uh, you're correct that um, it's going to become more and more important, especially, you know, in, in the realm of electrified heavy duty vehicles. I mean, the, the technology is going to have to uh, move very quickly if the Air Resources Board stays on its current trajectory. Thank you. That's my only input here. It's my understanding that those regulations relate to district owned vehicles, which, as you mentioned, either the leasing or contracting of vehicles to bring them in, maybe from out of state when we have a need. It's going to be a very awkward circumstance to dance around the regulations. Thank you. Director Weed, like a lot of other complex issues, we're going to endeavor to uh, manage this as best as we can. Thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions on this slide, I'll move to the next one. So this is um, another graphical representation of our 10 year CIP by program um, initially before we have um, I've been showing some of the large programs and um, the ones that are in construction because bulk of the investments happen during construction phase um, in the next four years uh, will be um, will be in construction on several programs. Um, as we wrap up Fish Passage program in 21, 22, we'll be um, working on our AMI project um, that's shown in green here. And we also have seismic improvements um, going into construction in the next two years. Um, we're currently in design on those projects. So a bunch of these investments will go towards those large programs. And then we're also showing the main renewal program that's going to have consistent um, investments throughout the program, not just for the next 10 years. Next slide, please. So here is a listing of um, all the projects in our CIP that are greater than half a million dollars. And um, this is um, mainly the investment or the commitment we are looking at um, for fiscal year 21, 22. Um, several of these projects are multi-year projects. These are large capital projects that would take multiple years to go from concept to completion. So the column on the um, right-hand side, the multi-year project cost that captures the total project cost Whereas the um, budget amount shown under annual budget that only shows the commitments the, um, for that specific fiscal year. Um, so the ones that are highlighted in purple, um, those are the ones uh, that are showing um, construction projects are anticipated to go into construction for 21-22 advanced metering infrastructure. We're already in POC phase and we anticipate to go into full deployment in next fiscal year. And also Avalon tank slope stabilization improvements is also anticipated to go into construction. Um, we have a Rado Nile seismic improvement project that is phase one is currently in construction. We also anticipate, we're also working on phase two design. And then rubber dam projects are currently in construction for this fiscal year. Miss um, Epagunta, I have a comment and a question here. First of all, on Los Vaqueros Reservoir, in the previous slide, you're presenting uh, 38 million. Here you're presenting 98 million. I'm wondering what the difference is. And then number two, my comment is, we went through a billion dollar expansion on Calaveras Reservoir. Uh, we have four, we own 4% or are responsible for 4% of the Hetch Hetchy system. So that billion dollar expansion cost us about 40 million. Here we're talking about two and a half times that for the LVE project. So to answer your first question, um... The 98.5 million that I'm showing here is the entire project cost. And um, this is uh, 
we are looking at about 4.5 million with the exception of the next two years. We have about four to four and a half million in perpetuity throughout the plan. So this 98.5 is for the entire 25 year plan. The one that um, we were looking at in the last slide was a 10 year plan. So in the next 10 years, the investments were in the range of 38. Um, whereas if you look at the 25 year plan, the total investment is 98.5. So that's the difference in these numbers. One is a 10 year outlook and one is a 25 year outlook. Well, you know, you don't have to answer this question right now, but based on what Mr. Wonderlick was saying, in terms of presenting a business case analysis to the board and our public, uh, if we're only planning on parking five or 10,000 acre feet, at Los Vaqueros, and we're spending $100 million proposed, there better be a, a very good business case for doing so. Yeah, and uh, and that's I think that's heard loud and clear, Director Sethi. And again, this um, what we're showing here, these are costs that the board has actually never, not yet approved in, in any kind of contract or anything like that. It's well understood that the board needs to see a convincing business case or have all of the information available before it will actually um, approve the expenditure of these costs, but we do need to make sure that we're planning. Uh, and so these are staff's best, um, you know, estimates in terms of what these costs would be should the board approve them. We want to ensure that they're showing up in our long term planning um, and, and also just to add um, you know, one of the things that we've heard from the board in the past is, you know, it's really difficult to capture or to get our arms around the entire costs of these very large projects or, or projects that span multiple years. And so what we're trying to do here is show for each of these line items in the CIP, there's the amount that would show up in, you know, the actual two year budget, the two years sort of CIP, but we also want to sort of provide full disclosure. This is the total amount that we're seeing as the potential cost for these line items over the entire 25 year CIP. And so that's why we're displaying the information this way. I would hope that we can expedite the LVE review. When I looked at the Bartel uh, estimates, one of their assumption was that the JPA would assume 70%, over 70% ownership of the existing facilities, LV one and two. And I wonder if that 70% was derived because they paid off 30% and we're going to pick up the remaining cost of, of the existing facilities. Um, it raises a lot of questions in my mind about the whole operation, the way they've uh, presented it to us. And that's why the um, pipeline only option may make far more sense if we just bought and owned the pipeline, which is not of any great benefit to Contra Costa. The other thing that was not included in that analysis from what I could see was any reference to the 40% public benefit requirement for the Prop 1 monies that they received for this project. This is uh, Director Gunther. I was wondering if we can go drop back uh, to the other slide again, the previous, and that um, I see a large seismic improvement cost or budget here um, how much is, is much of that, if is any of that actually included with pipeline or is that all considered in the main replacement program? Or is there a combination thereof? So most of the pipeline improvements are captured under our main renewal program, mm -hmm. um, including seismic improvements to our distribution and transmission mains. But the one that are shown here under seismic improvements in the next four years, those um, are more towards other facilities and primarily our reservoir roof replacements. Um, the, the next couple of years, that's where we are focusing on replacing the roofs, uh, making certain changes to our inlet outlet piping on, on some reservoirs as necessary, and also um, adding some water quality enhancements um, to address turnover issues um, and uh, chlorination, uh, water age issues. So all these are captured under those line items. Okay, I'll, I'll live with that for now. 
If there are no other questions, can we go on to the next slide, please? Okay, so here is a um, um, li listing of projects again, greater than half a million dollars by CIP line item. And these are the projects proposed uh, for fiscal year 22, 23. This is year two of our biennial budget. And uh, most of the projects you can notice that they have repeated um, some uh, new projects that you you can notice on this are um, our water treatment plant filter media replacement project. Um, this is our uh, routine replacement, but this is time to replace our filter media. It will be done in two um, in two years. So the first um, year is going to be in 22-23. And then the rest of the projects were uh, repeats from the last um, slide because those are multi-year projects again. Uh, Mission San Jose tank improvements. Um, the design will will be done next year. However, the construction is going to be um, in the following fiscal year. So that's why we are seeing this line item um, because it's greater than half a million dollars in terms of construction. Uh, the rest of the projects um, are again, uh, our um, distribution PLC. Uh, we are currently in doing design for eight facilities uh, for uh, replacing our PLC. So the actual construction will be completed in the following fiscal year, which is 22-23, year two. Um, and then we have, um, as I mentioned, reservoir roof replacements uh, will be kicking on and the Kirtner booster station project, um, the actual construction will be um, done during 22-23. Okay, so those are some of the highlights here. The Alameda uh, reservoir roof replacement, I could see 3 million for a roof replacement but 13 million over a period of years, um, you, is that not a one-year project? And what are, is, is it far more major than just a, a roof re replacement? This is mostly um, the roof replacement and some and structural improvements to the columns within the reservoir. So the, we just started design on that. There is seismic analysis that is currently underway to identify what other structural improvements would be necessary, but this budget includes, um, and this budget uh, is based on our actual estimates from our uh, recent project um, and escalated those. So based on those costs, um, the, the actual engineers estimate on this roof replacement project that includes some seismic improvements to the columns is $13 million. So are there any other questions? Okay, so with that, I'll wrap up the CIP update and then um, Mr. Aum will take over to discuss the financial planning model. If I could make one comment on the CIP, because there was some, you've only shown the projects of over a half million dollars. The overall CIP had a couple of other projects. One in particular was the removal of the Bunting and um, Nichols home. It was, I think it's misnamed as the Bunting home. They, um, Phil Hudick tore down the Bunting home. Uh, Gene Rhodes says the district secretary moved his, the district attorney, uh, oh, our district attorney, um, Gene Rhodes had moved his own secretary in after we evicted the Buntings, but they got into a dispute. So he evicted the secretary and they tore down the home. But there's another historic home on that property. And the Nichols home itself also has historic merit. I am president of the Washington Township Historical Society. I have another director in our um, ACWD that's the vice president. And I would ask that that item in particular be brought to a committee so we can review and decide what we might do and at the very least kick it down the road even farther than it is now, which is 24, 25. Yeah, this is Director Gunther. I have uh, also a very interested, particular interest in the Nichols home as well. Um, the home I grew up in Connecticut was built in 1719. So um, yeah, just give you a heads up. I also have an eye on that area over there as well and hope that we could actually, I know we've had something close, um, but that we don't just demo the place. Yeah, point noted, Director Skinther, and we will make sure um, when we get to that project, um, I'll certainly bring it to the committee. Yes, um, uh, Ms. Ipagunta, um, 
Paul Sethi here. Uh, I'm the vice president to John on the Washington Township Historical Society and a member of other historical societies in the area. So just for your knowledge, because I you were not here at the agency when this occurred, but after I joined the board, I worked with uh, one of our um, prominent uh, community members, Lila Bringhurst. The newest elementary school is named after her right here in Warm Springs. Um, and uh, she's a, she was a prominent member of the Mormon community as well. And the Nichols home is uh, one of the oldest homes in Alameda County. Nichols was part of the first migration of Mormons to California. Uh, uh, most of them settled right here in, in Southern Alameda County and Santa Clara County. And that Nichols home, and they came here in, uh, I think, 1848, and that home was built around 1851. So it has a foundation, uh, like D Director Gunther was saying, from the owner of the home who came from Connecticut. And rather than removing that, that home, uh, I really believe we need to make an investment uh, along with other private entities, including uh, the local Mormon stakes who have an interest in that home to restore that property fully. And working with uh, our former general manager, Walt Wadlow, and I think we may have had a meeting with Mr. Shaver too, uh, but we certainly had multiple meetings with the city of Fremont and the owners of the apartment complex that's next to our uh, Maori Peralta well field there. And uh, the uh, apartment complex owner had agreed to modifications to the rear of their uh, uh, complex so that we could have parking around the Nichols home and, uh, and also uh, uh, allow guest, additional guest parking for their accommodations. And so this is really a, a very historic property. It's been neglected. And I sincerely hope that the water district will make the investment to uh, fully restore this property. We have a lot of uh, historic documentation on this too, uh, done by well-renowned um, firms that do state and, and national historic uh, site studies. So this is a preservation effort. I'm. I'm very hopeful of that and not a removal effort on the part of ACWD. Yeah, and I, I can just chime in and uh, let, you, uh, let you know, we are very much aware of the, of the sensitivities and the potential prospects for both of those sites. Um, and you know, we do know that we need to do something to address them in, in one form or another. And you're right, Director Sethi, we have um, engaged in a number of different uh, approaches and had lots of discussions with different stakeholders. Um, and so it's in the CIP so that we do have it programmed that, that we can address these sites. Um, the, it's been in the CIP actually for many years. It just kind of keeps getting deferred. Uh, and so uh, we certainly would never do anything with those sites without having reviewed it with the board first. And so that would be our plan. And if you could put the correct name for the, uh, it's either Santos or Sanborn House, not the Bunting Home. Yes, so we'll make that correction and also change the removal to preservation, something more appropriate um, in terms of the effort we are looking at. Um, I actually had a, a question on the, uh, I think it was about $4 million on IT upgrades. Um, is that specific to custom development uh, only on like JD Edwards and Kant and, and CityWorks and all of that, or are there other associated costs? Those are mostly related to JD Kant uh, um, or existing um, updates to our existing uh, enterprise software and other software. Um, there is also 
um, some effort that goes into cybersecurity improvements um, that are currently done on the IT side um, in collaboration with cybersecurity improvements that are currently being planned on the SCADA side. There is a lot of collaboration that's necessary. So some of that budget is going towards um, IT side um, cybersecurity as well. And I have one question on an earlier slide that you showed under water supply, which is under your uh, capital expenditures. Is it our practice that when we do list something in the water supply and cap that we bill it as part of the commodity cost? As opposed to fixed cost? It was one of those definitions that I, has always confused me in our, in our process. And if you have time to come back to it, the finance committee, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, so um, Director Weed, uh, we don't we don't really have a history or practice of allocating costs from specific projects or line items specifically to either the uh, service charge or the commodity charge. I think that's something more that during rates workshops we discuss with the board in terms of the overall district cost structure and how the board feels that we should um, allocate our revenue recovery, but, but we don't have a history or practice of assigning specific line items uh, to one or other or the other category. Mike, part of my concern is we use the term water supply with different components and different uh, documents. So hopefully we'll have the opportunity to standardize that. Thank you. You know, I, I wanted to add something very quickly here in, in reference to these historic properties uh, like the Nichols home. Uh, the new CEO of Washington Hospital was giving a presentation to the Chamber of Commerce last year um, when they were uh, trying to uh, outline and promote the, the new bond uh, that they were uh, trying to gain support for in the November election. And she said something very important that really caught my eye. And I'm hoping that when we review our strategic plan and our mission statement, we may be able to include something uh, in terms of what our values are as an organization. She emphasized a very important point that <clears throat> the community supports and owns Washington Ta Township Hospital Care System, that the uh, it is a nonprofit organization. It's not there to make a profit. And when they do have excess funds, it's very important um, for their organization, their board, and the community to seek out uh, reinvestment of those excess funds into the community. And uh, I think we're in the same situation. We're a nonprofit. We're not here to make uh, profit off the community when we do have some excess funds available, and we certainly do. We've got $200 million in the bank right now. Uh, I think it's very important for us to uh, outlook reinvesting in important projects that benefit everyone in the, in the community. And uh, an investment in restoring the Nichols home is... Uh, of benefit, not only to everyone in Southern Alameda County, but to the full county and um, other citizens in, in the Bay Area. This is one of the oldest uh, homes in California. So I'll leave it at that. Okay. And I have one more question. I, I saw nothing in here related to the N3 Ranch. Um, without getting into any details, uh, do, uh, do we have a, a, when and where will that show up? Actually, we have a line item here. Um, the, this entry ranch is already part of the financial model, but we have captured the ca cost associated with um, with with the with the purchase of the negotiations under twenty one twenty two budget. Uh, Ms. Marco, if you could go two slides before. I saw you had watershed protection, but I didn't see a dollar amount. Watershed preservation, one slide before this. Yes, the last item here, watershed preservation and protection, oh, that's $5 million. Um, that's associated to entry range. And no multi-year cost projection. Currently, we are not showing that. And I don't know what that is. I say this uh, 
somewhat with good humor, you're missing a zero there. It should be 50 million. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so and... we, we do have operating costs uh, built into the financial model in the out years, but those would not be captured in the CIP. Right, and I would also just emphasize this is another one of those um, many items that are shown in, in terms of the CIP plan that has, has not been approved yet by the board. Thank you. Uh, before we move on, I would like to open it up to the members of the public as well to see if we have any questions or comments from the public. Are there uh, any members of the public who wish to make a comment or ask a question? Yeah, let's see. Mr. Kellier, the floor is yours. Oh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to, to um, uh, touch briefly on, on two things with, which are tied into the... One is um, demand, demand management, and the other one is financial stability. Uh, the, the district's model of demand management is, uh, it treats uh, demand as, a, as a, an exogenous variable, exogenous in the sense that it's out of your control and the market is gonna be stable or your demand is gonna uh, either be stable or, 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 or change over some, some fixed trajectory over the next few years. Um, in reality, the, the, I think the modeling needs to uh, take into account uh, uh, demand as a, uh, you need to, to, uh, to, to take measures that uh, uh, where, where you control demand, you seek to control demand, at least in terms of, uh, of, of uh, batching your demand with other districts nearby. Uh, for example, you're comparing your prices with other districts, so you can uh, compare how your demand is. If everybody else's demand is dropping by 10% or whatever, you should seek to match that. And then of course, the problem is that that also blows hole in your financing because uh, if demand were to drop due to drought or uh, due to uh, 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 due, due to uh, people uh, conserving for whatever reason, uh, then you would need to have financial measures in place to restore your financial uh, stability, uh, like drought surcharges or whatever. So those two things, I think, uh, it, rather than seeking to stabilize everything, uh, into the future because uh, because you, your physical so availability of water is uh, well uh, well in hand and well under control, you should seek to uh, actually be able to uh, deliver conservation as needed and not have it blow a hole in your finances. Thank you. Um, President Akbari, I, if you'd like, I can give a short response to that. Absolutely. Um, first of all, thank you, Mr. Abreu, for that comment. Uh, the district does not uh, consider water demand as outside of our control. Um, we take into account a number of factors when we are forecasting water demand, uh, including growth, development, our own conservation uh, programs and demand management programs. Uh, interesting concept about benchmarking to other agencies, but remember uh, there's different weather, microclimates in the Bay Area. Uh, there's different intensity of development with different uh, landscaped areas, different size lots, those kind of things. Um, so that's what uh, we, we track, overall water efficiency. And um, and then you'll see when we uh, look at our financial model runs that we also take into account uh, financial sensitivity to changes in customer demand. So uh, the board is very well aware that, uh, for example, if we ask our customers to conserve with our current rate structure, uh, that does impact revenue. However, uh, the board uh, the last time we did adjust rates, adopted stage rates, which are designed to minimize that, the, that revenue impact as well as to encourage additional conservation uh, during a water supply emergency. And that's when you'll see the most um, 
sort of draconian impact to the district's finances. This is something that we implemented as a lesson learned after the previous drought. So um, we, we do take into account the po possibility of variable demand. We do have the ability to control it somewhat, and that's also included in our AM, AMI project, and uh, appreciate the feedback. Thank you, Mr. Shaver. Uh, are there any other members of the public who wish to make a comment or ask a question? Hearing none, I will turn it back to staff. Okay, um, thank you, Ms. Ipukuta. Good evening, President Akmari, members of the board and, and staff. Uh, my name is Sydney Alm. I'm the supervising financial analyst. I will uh, cover the next section. Uh, we'll go over the, the, some of the key metrics uh, from our financial planning model, um, what we showed to the board uh, last uh, time at the, at the rate uh, process um, last year, uh, compared to the metrics uh, for uh, the proposed budget. Uh, starting with this slide, um, so speaking of the uh, demand, um, there are a few, um, uh, one of the changes is the water demand. It's, it have been um, a little higher than anticipated uh, for this year. And uh, staff uh, is assuming uh, slightly higher demands for the next uh, two uh, fiscal year. Um, our long-term uh, demand forecast remains at 35.2 uh, million gallons per day. Uh, the other uh, change is the general fund um, capital improvement program. Um, it is $9 million lower um, over the planning period um, through fiscal year 25-26 uh, in the proposed budget compared to, to the, the rate process last year. Um, this is due to uh, the project costs um, are now being more uh, smoothed out um, over the um, next several years. Um, obviously that all these changes would affect the ending cash balance. Um, uh, now with the proposed budget, the projected ending cash balance for um, the general fund in the low year um, is at $27 million above the reserve target. Um, if I can make a quick, uh, quick comment that on the demand issues, the peak demand is really what drives our capital uh, expenditures. And we're, I believe we're still running in the $50 million range where we have 50 million gallons per day when we have a capacity of let's say 90 MGD. So we're well, well below that. But it would strike me that one of the planning metrics we need to keep an eye on is what is our peak demand uh, at the district. That's what drives your capital investment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so moving on to the next slide, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, this slide shows the ending cash balances uh, for the general fund, as I just uh, spoke about. Um, so the ending uh, balances over the next two fiscal year, that's the budget year, um, as shown here, are well above the reserve targets. Um, and the projected ending balances um, over the next several years, uh, what we call the planning period, uh, through fiscal year 25-26 uh, remain uh, above the, the reserve target uh, set by the board. Um, the um, fiscal year 25-26 um, is the 27 million I mentioned earlier. Um, now these balances uh, shown here um, do not reflect the changes that um, we discussed with the board last week. Um, I just wanna provide a recap of those changes. Um, um, the changes discussed last week um, added um, to the fiscal year 2021 uh, the remaining uh, $1 million uh, grant uh, from Oliver De Silva uh, for the Alamon Creek uh, Fish Passage Projects, um, added $305,000 in fiscal year 21 22 uh, for the water conservation program uh, changes uh, due to the current uh, dry conditions, and uh, reduced total chemical cost uh, by $57,000 over the two fiscal year. Um, to reflect updated pricing that staff just received um, for various chemicals. Um, some chemical uh, would go up and some would go down, but a net um, cost would uh, be reduced by 57,000 over two years. Um, after the, the 
discussion last week, uh, staff is now uh, proposing additional changes uh, for the final budget for board consideration. Um, that include uh, two things. Uh, one is changes to the water purchase cost, and the other is the changes to authorized position. Um, staff is proposing to add $4 million for um, additional water purchases uh, for this year and the next uh, two fiscal year. Um, so that's total 4 million. Um, 1.9 million of that is uh, for SFPUC. Uh, 1.8 is uh, Symmetropic Water and $300,000 for uh, your state water projects. Um, this is based on the, the latest water supply modeling um, and to enhance uh, operational planning you know, in case of poor water supply in the coming years. And, and now, um, because of the evolving dry conditions, um, we can now assume with confidence um, that the fiscal year 22-23 costs uh, will likely include increased semi-tropic costs. Um, so we are now um, adding those costs to the budget. Um, additionally, three new positions are uh, proposed for board consideration. Um, a special assistant to the general manager, uh, uh, starting in fiscal year 21-22, um, information security officer, and a water operations analyst, uh, both uh, starting in fiscal year 22-23. Um, with all these uh, proposed changes, uh, what discussed last week, and uh, with the new proposed um, uh, proposal, uh, the ending balance, as you see here, uh, would, for the general fund, um, would drop to $90.5 million um, in fiscal year 25-26. Now, $91 million, um, that is still uh, $23 million above uh, the reserve target. Um, now, I would like to take a moment to, to turn it over uh, to our incoming uh, general manager, uh, Mr. Ed Stevenson, um, to describe the, uh, the additional three positions. Yeah, thanks very much, Mr. Ohm. And, and I just did want to make a few remarks with regard to these um, three additional positions. And really, uh, these are um, the result of, of a lot of uh, thinking that I've been doing um, as your incoming general manager about our priorities, uh, what's in store for us as an agency into the future. Um, and so uh, Mr. Um mentioned the three positions that I'm proposing to be added. And of course, um, these would show up in the in staff's proposed final proposed budget that the board would see in June. And just wanted to make a couple of quick remarks about um, what, what the rationale is behind these. Um, as Mr. Um pointed out, um, I, I am proposing to add to the personnel budget um, a special assistant to the general manager. And this is um, a position the district has had in the past on a few occasions. Um, and but uh, more recently, we've not had that position. I'm, I'm proposing to add it back um, beginning next fiscal year. And the idea behind the role of the special assistant to the general manager is really to work with the general manager and the executive staff team and others uh, within the district, really focusing on a wide range of strategic issues for the district, both district wide and um, and and then into the industry as well. Uh, the position really would have the, the primary responsibility for coordinating and conducting strategic planning efforts within the agency and then ultimately with the board. I think one of the things that's important to me is that this agency remains aligned with this board and that we're um, pulling as, as best we can in the direction that the board would have us um, move. And so, uh, so that strategic planning effort and coordination with the board is going to be something that's very important uh, to me, and this position would uh, assist with that. But it would also play a role in um, aligning and ensuring that our various planning efforts are master planning for emergency response and preparedness, uh, for operational optimizations, for information technology and cybersecurity, uh, our facilities and infrastructure planning, water supply and employee engagement, that these are all in alignment with the district's overall strategic plan and that, um, and that they're um, consistent with one another. Um, 
And then that position would also manage um, other special projects as, as needed, would lead internal groups and task forces engaged in internal improvements um, that we're working on and that we will be working on and also engaging in legislative issues and um, and um, all, also represent the district in many cases in various uh, industry groups. Uh, and, um, and so in general, a, a lot of big picture district work um, to keep us A, aligned with the board and B, um, in our position within the industry as advancing the, the cause of our, of our customers. Um, the, uh, Mr. Um mentioned the information security officer. And this is uh, a position that my proposal is to add that position in the second of the two fiscal years in this budget. Um, this would be a, a primarily responsible for integrating um, all of the various uh, cybersecurity related efforts of the, the various functions within the district that all have cybersecurity related um, roles. Uh, to provide planning and implementation oversight across the district, across all of our operations, our information systems, and our organizational groups. Uh, and this, per this position would be responsible to integrate those, those um, plans and also develop the policies that would apply district-wide um, and, and ensure that the improvements that we have planned are happening and that they're coordinated and that also we're coordinating with federal, state, and local authorities and industry groups to maximize the district's cybersecurity posture. Uh, and so, um, so this is something that I think is very important. I'm not proposing it until the second fiscal year, mostly to align with timing of major cybersecurity improvements that we're planning related to our our operational technology um, side, which is our SCADA system, our system control and data acquisition project, which is uh, a major lift that includes major cybersecurity improvements. And so just essentially to align with the timing of that project is uh, uh, my thinking with regard to adding that position in the second fiscal year. And similarly, with regard to the uh, water operations analyst, this position is really focused on leveraging the, the mass amounts of operational data that we are, uh, we've been uh, increasingly um, um, working with, but also with the advanced metering infrastructure project, we'll have a great deal more. And so the idea here is to really leverage that data um, to, to move us forward, to, to increase our operational efficiencies to optimize our water supply and production operations, to meet regulatory requirements, um, to support our strategic planning um, and in our water use efficiency programs, and so um, so we we are move, we have been moving in that direction um, recently. Um, we've been doing this um, with some a defined term position. And um, I, I, I expect that this will be uh, a need and a benefit for this agency moving forward. And so my proposal is to add that position uh, to our uh, personnel budget in the second fiscal year. It's possible that there will be a need to add a permanent position before then, um, but that would be done using an existing vacant position, which we would then backfill with the additional position that I'm proposing be added here for the um, next two year budget. Mr. Stevenson, this is yeah. uh, Paul Sethi. Yes. Are we on the right slide here for what you're talking about? So there's not a separate slide associated with, with this. Uh, I just wanted to ensure that I was putting it out there um, for the board's information. There'll be more information with the final dra uh, draft proposed budget in, in June. But I just wanted to ensure that um, that the board and the public were hearing my thinking about these positions. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, John Weed, a quick thought. Um, hiring people is great, but I am, one thought is we have not set aside a separate budget for contingency planning and preparation. And you know, ask, encourage you to consider um, creating a, a fund mechanism along to go along with the responsibilities of that budget um, to execute uh, the contingency response and planning. 
Yes, yeah, certainly emergency response and contingency operations, that's going to be an important part of our future. And one of the things that I'm really um, interested in is making sure that we're ready. And so you can see that two of these positions are really focused on readiness and preparedness. And so um, uh, we will definitely be making more improvements in those areas. Thank you. Any other questions or um, or feedback uh, for me or staff on that topic before we move on? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Um, now we can move on to the next slide, please. Okay, this is um, this is looking at the um, the debt coverage uh, ratios. Um, that's comparing net revenues to the district annual debt service. Um, as indicated by the, the dotted blue lines, um, the district continues to maintain uh, strong debt coverage ratios um, over the planning period, um, well above the 200% target um, set by the board. Um, as you notice, the, the ratio dropped down to about 500% by fiscal year 25-26. Um, this is primarily due to the, the additional debt service payment um, for the um, state revolving fund loan uh, for AMI. Um, that is a, a $19.5 million loan um, amortized over a 20-year period, um, a 20-year term at a, a very low interest rate of 1.2%. Um, the annual estimated annual debt service for that um, is $1.1 million and that would start in fiscal year 22-23. Um, this slide compares the um, operating revenues and operating expenses. Um, the purpose of this slide is to show that, um, that the district um, relies on other revenue uh, sources, um, such as property taxes and interest income um, to help fund um, operating expenses. As you see um, on the slide there, uh, starting in fiscal year 23-24, um, operating expenses are projected to, to exceed the operating revenues um, by about uh, 2 million to 6 million um, annually um, over the planning period. Um, so the district uh, currently receives approximately uh, $12 million um, annually in property taxes revenue. And, um, uh, about or close to close to three between two and a half to three million dollars in, in annual um, interest revenue so that's um, help uh, fund the uh, the funding gap um, similarly uh, this metric uh, specifically looks at uh, districts uh, rate and charge revenue uh, compared out to revenue requirement um, the revenue requirement um, is our total um, operating and maintenance expenses uh, plus debt service. Um, as the chart um, indicates, again, there are funding gaps uh, for certain years if it's compared to uh, those two. Um, uh, this shows that the district um, does rely on other revenue sources um, to fill the funding gaps. Next slide, please. Uh, here we go. Um, so this, this shows the uh, CIP budget, uh, we looked at CIP and, and various components, you know, the 10 year CIP, 25 years, the two year. Um, so they just uh, give a, a summary of um, the CIP again over the planning period by uh, funding different funding sources. Um, just looking at the general fund CIP um, over the planning period, um, 271, um, uh, now 280 when we looked at uh, with the board, um, at the, at the rates process now is $271 million. Um, that's a, a drop of $9 million. Um, if you look at the, the slide, the, the one for the proposed budget is more uh, smoothed out. Um, so the project costs uh, now um, are more smoothed out over the, the planning period. So you don't see um, some years a lot higher than others. Um, so that's, that's the looking at the metrics and, and I'd like to pause here for a few minutes uh, to see if you have any questions um, on those uh, before we move on to the, um, 
the uh, planning models and areas. Uh, yes, in your last graph, you showed a 2022 bump, a significant bump based on debt issuance. Uh, where do we stand on the approval process for that? I, I will have to defer to Mr. Wanderlich to, um, to help me with that. Um, Yes, yeah, so the discussions with the state water board re revolving the or or about the state revolving fund loan are ongoing. Um, and, you know, we continue to have some documents go go back and forth uh, between us and them. And I think we're hopeful that by late summer, we will have a final loan agreement. And so it's not that we're issuing is something that we're we're committed to pay to the state. Should they be able to get their act together in the next next year? Yeah, so it's it, it is you know somewhat of a cumbersome administrative process to take out a loan through the state revolving fund, uh, but given the low interest rate, uh, one point two percent for loans taken out this year, it, it's worth the effort. And uh, the nineteen and a half million is specifically toward the AMI project. Okay, so that's part of the that's AMI that. That's helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's no uh, further debt issuances that are planned uh, at this time in the financial model, just the, the loan from the state revolving fund. Uh, any other questions from directors? If not, I will pause for questions from members of the public. Hearing none and seeing no hands raised, I think I can turn it back to staff then. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we'll move on now to, to looking at um, different planning uh, model scenarios um, you know, related to potential uh, water conservation. Um, so we'll look at that over the next uh, several slides. Uh, staff looked at three specific scenarios, um, and there could be more um, or different uh, scenarios. So scenario one, um, that we looked at is a 5% decline in build demand uh, for each of the next two years. Um, scenario two uh, is a 5% decline next year, uh, followed by a 10% decline the following year. And then the, the third scenario is a 10% decline um, in uh, projected build demand uh, um, for each of the next uh, two fiscal year. Next slide, please. Excuse me on that last one. That's not cumulative. You're saying 10% for each of the years based on the current um, status. We had it over 20% in the last drought, as I recall. So you're saying that the current, there are projections now that our conservation will be about less than half of what it was in the last drought. Uh, Director Weed, if I may um, chime in, recall that we're almost 15% lower demand now than in 2013. So we, um, at the peak of the drought, yeah, we did get um, more than 20% conservation, but an additional 10% uh, conservation would be significant uh, because we're you know, customers are still pretty efficient. Okay. That's yeah, so no worse than 10, thank you. Yeah, so it would actually take about a 15% reduction would take us down to just about where we were at the very lowest point during the recent drought. So, so this 10% scenario gets us pretty far toward that. Okay, yeah, but our revenues are about 50% higher than they were, more than 50% higher than they were in the last drought. Interesting, All right. Okay, this is, um, this is showing the general fund ending balance uh, for the first scenario, that's the 5% um, conservation each of, a, each of a year. Um, so we're showing the general fund balance um, the low year here at uh, 21 or close to $22 million above the reserve target. Um, now it's a drop of about $5 million compared to, to the status quo or, or without conservation. Um, again, this doesn't reflect the proposed changes we, I just discussed. Um, uh, with, with all the changes uh, proposed for the final uh, proposed budget, 
uh, the low year for the, the scenario one would be um, $18 million above uh, the reserve target. Okay, this is the, um, so this is looking at the 5% 5, 5 in the first year and then 10% um, cons conservation in the following year. Um, the ending cash balance uh, for the general fund in the low year um, is close to $19 million above the reserve target. Um, again, with the proposed changes, it would be uh, $15 million above uh, the reserve target. Um, we have straight, do we trigger stage rates in any of these? And the first question, the second question, if we do get 10% for each of two years, are we looking at a 50% rate increase per our staged rate uh, proposal we had last time? Uh, this does not include, include that. So this is adjusting or projected bill demands um, based on the percentage, the assumed uh, percentage um, conservation. Yeah, the, I think the assumption is that um, just for the this hypothetical scenario, that we're not declaring a water supply emergency and that we wouldn't be instituting stage rates. Um, that said, that is always a tool that the board has at its disposal and certainly uh, would mitigate um, the impacts if the drought uh, gets more severe, the financial impacts if the drought gets more severe. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so this is the third scenario, looking at a 10% um, decline in the projected bill demands over the, the next two years of 10 and 10. Um, the ending balance uh, in the low year here is uh, about $14.4 million above the reserve target um, with the additional proposed changes. Uh, the low balance uh, would be uh, 10.5 million above the target. Um, now it's, it's to note that even with this level of conservation, 10% um, for each of the two years. Uh, the district would still maintain the general fund ending balances um, above the reserve target um, over the planning period. Um, this is looking at you know, water conservation impacts both revenues and, and expenses. Um, and although loss of revenue is, is only uh, partially offset by savings uh, from lower production costs. Um, so this is showing the, the revenue loss and the, the savings in water production for each of the scenario. Um, scenario one uh, would result in a, a $9 million in, in revenue loss. Um, on the flip side, uh, there would be an estimated savings in, in water production um, um, at, at $4 million. Uh, for scenario two, um, revenue loss increased. Um, um, to $13.7 million, um, and the savings only slightly increased about well, um, $1.1.5 million, um, now to $5.5 million for scenario two um, in, in lower production costs. And for the third scenario, um, estimated uh, water revenue loss um, is $18.1 million, and the um, savings in production, water production is $5.9 million. Um, you know, higher High level um, conservation impact, the percent increase um, affected the, the revenues more, more so than it does on water production. As you noticed, um, you know, it goes from 4 million to 5.5 to 5.9. Um, this is primarily due to uh, most of the uh, water production costs, a uh, fixed cost. So that, that um, concluded the scenario. So here's the, our staff recommendation. Um, with water conservation, um, our staff recommendation is for the board to, to evaluate the conservation scenarios and um, any potential uh, financial impacts. Um, we're asking the board to authorize the full uh, water supply purchases as presented, um, included the, the $4 million changes I mentioned earlier. Um, the, you know, there should be consistency uh, between revenue loss um, uh, due to conservation with, with some reduction in, in revenues, as we've just shown in the last slide. Um, and we're not setting rates in the financial planning model uh, based on the, the conservation scenario um, that we just um, discussed. 
Um, our staff will, will look at the actual experience um, regarding water conservation um, over the next uh, a few months. And then we will update um, the financial planning model based on that um, uh, for the rate setting workshops uh, that are planned for uh, later this year. Um, next slide, please. And, and that's conclude the scenario. And um, you know, before I turn it back over to Mr. Wanderlick, I would, again, I wanna pause if you have any questions on that uh, part of the presentation. Um, I just have a general comment. Uh, it relates back to Director Weed's comment about the uh, peak demand, um, the uh, district sizing to peak demand, and and I, I don't remember if that is included anywhere in the presentation. Uh, and I I do feel that that's uh, very applicable, um, and that even just a reference to the fact that we size to a peak demand of some number because there could be a false expectation that our average daily demand is you know, 36, when reality is our peak demand could be as high as 55 or greater. Um, and that it's very important that we size the system for that peak demand. And like I said, it doesn't have to be very big, but I think it would be nice if that was at least referenced in there. And I don't remember it being referenced uh, uh, am I correct, Director Weed? Do you remember seeing it? No, and I, it was interesting. A project where that had a direct impact was the Mission San Jose uh, Ultra uh, Filtration Project, where we were adding another five MGD up to the five, three to five MGD when we had 100% over capacity at the time. So that was a um, where decisions are made on where you put your money and, and needs for future. But we do need. Um, and our shortages will come during a drought when the basic water supplies are restricted and we don't have Del Val and some other options available to us. Yeah, so that's a good point about making sure that the board is comfortable in which, uh, and, and, the, and the public understands uh, how the district, um, you know, sort of, um, positions ourselves and sizes our facilities and so forth. It's a little more complicated than just demand, um, but uh, we, we can do that. Um, just to remind the board on the process, the integrated resources plan, you know, incorporates the projected water demands and that determines what water supplies uh, the district needs to make sure uh, that we have. And then an outcome of that is something historically that we've done called the engineering report, which has a whole bunch of criteria that we design our facilities for. And so as we're going in to the IRP update process, I would expect that that would lead into the engineering report process and would help uh, because the IRP does also size facilities but it, traditionally the engineering report takes it down to peak demand, not just peak day, but peak hour. So depending on the, the scenarios that we're running. And, um, and then in sort of a micro sense, when we look at the distribution system, uh, demand uh, doesn't even tend to be the determining factor of how your facilities get sized, it's fire flow. So um, anyway, I, I think it's a good point. We should include some information uh, regarding, you know, projected peak demands and things like that as we, as we do the budget process. So I agree. Okay, I, that, that's actually a comment. Um, one of the sessions I sat in in the, the water conference, there was a community that, you know, it grew up from an irrigation district. They didn't have a fire flow system and now they're looking at establishing one and the cost is phenomenal. And, uh, you know, our rate payers have paid for that. And I think sometimes they tend to forget the value of that system that we've paid for. Whereas these communities, and this one was up in the Sonoma area, if I remember correctly, you know, they're developing this, they build these homes, they never put a fire flow system in. And suddenly it's like, whoa, we don't have, we don't have a fire hydrant or something and, and well, we'll just build them. 
and the cost is astronomical. Yeah, I mean, even in the historic areas of our own distribution system, uh, you know, we've had areas with two inch water mains. I mean, <laughs> that's not going to put out a fire. And we still have um, a, a few isolated areas with four inch water mains, I believe, and those are part of the water main renewal project that was we had four inch water mains up in the um, in the Canyon Heights area. And that was one of the reasons why we did a comprehensive main replacement program up there as part of the earlier part of our main replacement program. So um, good comment. I think uh, when we go through the process ag again, we will definitely make sure that we incorporate some of that. And just while I'm thinking out loud, even some of our sizing criteria relates to whether or not we have power. So there, there's a whole bunch of factors that factor into how we uh, you know, size our facilities and our distribution system. Thank you. Um, one other item would be, there was a news release that went out by Shape Our Fremont that uh, identified that Fremont has planning staff has pitifully little or few projects in their inbox that um, what's being built now is uh, what they're monitoring, but there's nothing on, nothing coming in the door. So we rely on facility um, connection charges for much of a new construction. And that may be drop off precipitously this coming year. Yeah, so um, uh, I had a recent conversation with a couple of supervisors in our DMD group. And uh, there's no doubt that some of the, the growth related work has slowed down and good thing, it's allowing us to kind of take a breath and now uh, kind of pivot towards doing preventative maintenance work. We were so busy, um, you know, uh, providing service to the, the new developments that um, it's actually from, from my perspective, uh, a good thing that we can now focus more on some of the preventative maintenance uh, work that we, were, that we need to do. So that's great. Um, I also wanna remind the board that um, really, when we collect the uh, facilities connection charges, you know, that forms, uh, you know, a sinking fund that's used for growth related projects. So theoretically, for ACWD, if all growth stopped, we would be fine. Um, you know, new growth also buys in now to a portion of the, um, the distribution system, but um, we're not relying per se, um, you know, on on our day to day operations or anything like that on development fees. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from directors before we open it up to the public? None from Sefi. All right, I will turn it over. I think we have Mr. Kelly of Rue has a question. Yeah, uh, thank you. The, um, when you look at the, the uh, conservation scenarios, I would put up some benchmarks about, uh, you know, we're this year or this quarter, we're conserving this much and East Bay Mud is doing this, SFPC is doing that, Valley Water is doing that. Here's where we stand in the conservation sweepstakes. Because if you don't put a, a look at the metrics, somebody else will, and you'll they'll come back and say uh, that you conserve too much or you conserve too little or you didn't conserve at all, and everybody else was conserving uh, ten percent or whatever. So that's got to be the the expectation. You you don't want to fall out of line with uh, with whatever it is that that your peers are doing, uh, regardless of your capacity to deliver water. Uh, it might be a bad thing to deliver the full amount of water that uh, that uh, the, the market wants. Maybe you want to conserve 10% or whatever, uh, depending on what the what what the situ the political situation is. And then also, when people operate reservoirs, uh, they're looking they're putting out scenarios for seven year droughts or whatever, uh, or a, a a five year drought followed by a three year drought. And the five year drought was the uh, drought of the 19 uh, whatever's and the Three-year drought was the drought of the 1930s, and they combine these droughts and come up with fantastically uh, pessimistic scenarios for droughts. 
uh, and then they, they, they're sizing their reservoirs or whatever it is uh, based on, on this kind of thing. So when it comes to you know, uh, scenarios and planning, you wanna perhaps uh, not just look at 10%, but if you, you had a 20% conservation, if that happened, to, if a 20% conservation happened uh, in 2014 or whenever it was, then put that in as, as a, a, a scenario and, and have uh, one or two or three scenarios that, that peak out at these fantastically pessimistic things uh, just for planning purposes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blue. Um, Mr. Shaver, did you did staff want to respond to that or? Um, yeah, I mean, a couple of things. Um, if uh, Mr. Brew is interested, there is a supply conditions map that ACWD participates in by the um, uh, Bay Area Regional Reliability Group that we are a member of. And that can be found at bayareareliability.com, su supply conditions. So um, I don't know if there's a conservation sweepstakes, but we do, uh, we do uh, monitor what other agencies are doing and so do others. So uh, I feel pretty good about ACWD's approach. And then regarding the um, sort of different uh, planning scenarios uh, for, for droughts, uh, that's, a lot of that is uh, now determined by, by um, statute and are included in our urban water management plan. And there's some pretty draconian uh, scenarios in there that we plan for. Um, so uh, we, we do plan for um, a significant number of dry years in a row or seriously um, dry conditions. And so it's all, all part of our, our overall planning process. And uh, we, we look at other scenarios ourselves just to make sure that we feel good about where we are because running out of water is not an option. And um, so I encourage Mr. Abreu, if he hasn't already done so, to check out our urban water management plan, which is posted on our district website. Mr. Shaver, if I may add here to your comments, um, <clears throat> Mr. Abreu might wanna check out the BOSCA website too for all the 26 agencies that participate in BOSCA, um, uh, all the members there uh, submit the data from their individual districts. And they also have a link to the Bay Area Reliability Network that you're talking about. And uh, they also aggregate uh, the usage by all agencies uh, per, per capita uh, household usage indoor and outdoor usage. So San Francisco, which has very little outdoor terrain has the lowest uh, uh, usage per capita, but the, compared to communities in the South Bay or East Bay, uh, where you have lots of outdoor irrigation, it's different. But uh, that's a good uh, um, data set comparing all the agencies in the Bay Area and you know, the cities. Thank you for those questions and comments. Uh, are there any other questions or comments from members of the public? Hearing none, I will then uh, turn it back to staff to go over next steps. All right, thank you, President Akbari, members of the board. Uh, so, uh, We've covered a lot of territory between last week and so far in today's workshop. And so we just want to circle back and, and make sure we've, we've heard all the feedback correctly. Um, we've certainly heard loud and clear the feedback regarding the historic home preservation project. Uh, you know, also heard the feedback about uh, looking at, at incorporating some discussion of uh, peak system demands as it relates to the CIP. And, uh, and so we've definitely heard that feedback today, um, as well as, you know, looking, um, you know, again, making sure that we're continuing to prioritize our emergency response and contingency planning. So, so we've heard that feedback, um, you know, in regard to the conservation scenarios, uh, I just wanted to emphasize uh, what Mr. Allen was talking about there, that, that really in terms of the budget, 
uh, really what we're asking for is just to make sure we have enough budget authority to buy all the water we might need to in case customers do not conserve. Um, if we were having a rate setting workshop rather than a budgeting workshop, you know, it would be a very different discussion because then we would need to perhaps select a, a likely scenario that we think would happen as, as that would be uh, influential in, in setting rates. Um, and then now uh, today we've also presented a few additional changes to the operating budget from last week in terms of additional water supply purchases uh, based on our latest modeling and uh, some additional staffing resources. And so I, I think what I'd like to do now is just stop and um, confirm with the board that you're comfortable with what's been proposed there for the operating budget uh, before we finalize that and build it into what will be presented for adoption in June. I'll make a comment. I would encourage the staff to revisit the briefing that was given to the board following the last drought which showed a $60 million shortfall in our budget um, and our income over three years. We're now saying we're going to be have less than half that, even though our total water sales are probably 40, 50% higher. So just as a check, it may well be that we've hardened our um, demand and um, we are have less flexibility there. But um, I think it'll be informative to, see, to take a look at, the, at that briefing and what was necessary to make up the difference, including a budget, a rate surcharge, which generated about twelve and a half million dollars, and some other elements that we did. Thank okay, you. So, so, so to provide some specific numbers, uh, currently we're you know we're at about thirty five MGD in water sales. During the last drought, our very low point, our, our lowest year was 28 and a half MGD. Uh, if you adjust that to consider that about 5,000 new accounts have been added to our water system uh, since then, you would be looking at about 29 and a half MGD as the real low point once you consider all those you know, additional residences and, and businesses that have been added. And so the 10% conservation scenario that was presented for the next two years, you know, drops us down to about 31 and a half to 32 MGD. So it gets us down pretty close uh, to kind of the equivalent of what we had during the last drought. And um, at least at this point, the level of messaging is not as uh, serious or severe as it was in the last drought. So we don't anticipate the same level of conservation. And I would suggest that uh, when we talk about the financial um, ramifications and potential, you know, actions that the district can take, August, uh, you're planning a financial workshop to begin the conversation about uh, rate structure and, and, and rates and those kind of issues. So uh, that would be a great time to look at, you know, the potential you know, drought related water demands. Um, we know we're not going to get a significant amount of rain between now and August. So the, the conditions won't change much, but unless something unforeseen happens, but um, that would be a good time to kind of cover all of those issues, I would think. Yeah, certainly at that point, we'll have a an idea of how our customers are responding during the summer months, you know, if they've decided to turn their sprinklers off or not. I suggest that that is really a function of the regional media, uh, whether there's a panic or not. That's somewhat out of, I believe it's out of our control, but that's my take. Thank you. Um, um, Mr. Wonderlich, uh, Paul Sethi here. I approve of the uh, proposed operating budget, and I have no further comments than what I made during the meeting. Great. Thank you, Director Sethi. Same and here. Uh, Mr. Wendelik, I'm happy and comfortable with what staff has presented, so thank you. Jim Gunther, I'm happy too. I'm good. And likewise for myself. Great. Um, all right, then if we could advance to the next slide. Uh, so then at the June 10th board meeting, we will uh, 
present the uh, the final proposed budget for your in capital improvement program for your adoption. Uh, it looks like we will not need a special meeting on June 24th for the budget. It doesn't mean we might not still need a June 24th special board workshop. Uh, we just won't need it to adopt the budget. And then August 26th is the first of three rate setting workshops planned for this year. And as Mr. Shaver mentioned, uh, we will come fully prepared to walk through various scenarios related to conservation and revenues. And um, we'll also be prepared. We know there's significant board interest that we look into this. Uh, so we will be prepared for a discussion about use of the property tax role for uh, collecting service charges as well as uh, any uh, delinquencies. So we will be prepared uh, for an in-depth discussion on that topic in August. Are we um, planning on using Reftelis again? Uh, yes, uh, they are uh, still under contract with us. And uh, as we did not um, move forward with a rate adjustment uh, earlier this year, based on the study they completed last year, uh, the intent would be that we essentially um, dust off the work that was completed last fall, um, update it with uh, with the budget data that, that we'll have now uh, from the budget that's adopted, and then that will serve as the baseline to move forward. In terms of a formal cost of service study, uh, the board can actually uh, still adopt the study that was performed by Raftalis last year. Uh, the, you know, there's no need to change that as as the underlying cost of service study, unless of course the board has an interest in say making a change to the rate structure or allocations between fixed and variable uh, revenue collections, right? So if, if there was a desire in making changes along those lines, then we would need to make some corresponding updates to that study. Uh, but otherwise it will serve as a great springboard in, into the discussions later this summer. And Mr. Wonder, like before we leave this slide, I just wanted to emphasize for the board that the June 24 board workshop, please don't clear your calendar. Um, even if it's not needed for the budget, we are still planning to review our advanced metering infrastructure proof of concept results at that workshop. As you recall, with that project, there's an off ramp that's available for the district to take should we not be satisfied with the direction that we're going. And so this is the workshop that we have targeted to review those results and ensure that we're on the right track. So we wanna share a good deal of information about AMI at that workshop. So don't clear your calendar, please. Thank you. And let me suggest our next rate uh, review that we consider a three-year um, um, rate adjustment, which would put us back in the cycle where we um, do not have the rate increases in an election year. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, that concludes staff's budget presentation, uh, unless there are any further questions. I will open it up one last time for any questions from members of the board or members of the public. Hearing none, I think we can conclude this item. Wonderful, thank you to staff um, for a great presentation. We will move on to item number five, general manager's reports. Uh, Mr. Shaver, are there any reports from the general manager? Uh, none from me, President Sethi, and I'm looking at staff and I do not see any uh, other interest in doing that. So no general manager reports. President Sethi. <laughs> Um, I think they should have been a barry, Mr. Cheever. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Um, Thank you for reappointing me. <laughs> I don't think I have that authority, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was I was just looking at your uh, uh, you your your image was on my screen, and I, I just <laughs> I had a brain fade. Sorry about that. No problem. No problem. All right, moving on to item six: directors' comments. Uh, and or agenda item requests. Are there any comments from any directors? 
If not, I have just one quick item. Um, yesterday, uh, Mr. Shaver and I were invited to uh, present to the Sierra Club on um, saltwater intrusion into the Niles Cone. Um, and, uh, you know, we had a very, <laughs> a very brief discussion. I think we only had about 15, 15 or so minutes. Uh, Mr. Shaver gave a great presentation and I believe Laura and her team helped quite a bit in that. So I just wanted to express my appreciation for everyone on staff. All right. Thank you. Uh, quick report on Bosca. The uh, Bosca <clears throat> had their uh, meeting in May at the uh, third week, the uh, third Thursday. They made a determination not to file as an active party in the um, um, adjust uh, with the San Joaquin uh, unimpaired flow uh, controversy and let San Francisco, which is an active party to take the lead on that and they would observe. But it was noted that the rule currently is 40% unimpaired flows. They're trying to go with voluntary agreements. But in any case with the anticipated lawsuits um, that any change to voluntary agreements would probably take five years, which puts it beyond the time of our latest version of the um, urban water management plan. So we're, I believe the urban water management plan that we have assumes unimpaired flows on the San Joaquin for the five years. And it's unlikely that'll change within that five year period. Thank you. Thank you, Director Weed. Uh, if there are no other director's comments, I will conclude this item. And we can move, <coughs> excuse me, we can move into item 7.1. Pursuant to California government code section 54957.6, conference with labor negotiators, the agency designated negotiators are Robert Shaver, Jennifer Salito, Jonathan Wunderlich, and Stacy Q. And the employee organizations are the Operating Engineers Local 3 and ACWD Operators' Association. And with that, I will ask the district secretary to move us into closed session, please. All right, uh, it is 7.33 p.m. and the board has reconvened into open session. We've concluded item 7.1, pursuant to California government code section 54957.6 conference with labor negotiators, agency designated negotiators are Robert Shaver, Jennifer Salito, Jonathan Wunderlich, and Stacey Q. And the employee organizations are the Operating Engineers Local 3 and ACWD Operators Association. And direction was provided to the agency negotiators. That concludes item 7.1. And with that, we will adjourn tonight's meeting at 7.34 p.m. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Have a nice night. Good night.